So we'll have everything enabled in here. We'll just have it set as read only so the user can't really do anything with the data until they click on the edit button. And you'll see that that's pretty common in database applications uh, these days to make everything read only until the user clicks the edit button. Uh, if we didn't have an edit but it, button, sure, it would be a lot faster. Users could just click on an item, make changes, hit save, click on an item, hit changes, make save. But it's also a lot more dangerous because, you know, you're, you're not... It's better to give them the ability to go into an edit mode so they know they're in edit mode, then they have to cl click save or cancel to, uh, to make their changes stick. So that's the text box control and probably what you'll be using it for 90% of the time. Now, we also have the masked edit text box control. And this is a pretty nice control because what it allows you to do is give your users a little help and also uh, give you a little help on the data formatting side because if you're expecting data in a specific format, this will allow us to enforce that format. And again, it kind of works two ways. It'll help us because we, we can trim down on the validation of data, especially if it's going into a database, and we can also give the user assistance to how the data should be formatted. And to give you an idea here, uh, what you can do is uh, actually use their smart tag here and, and hit set mask. Uh, other ways you can do that here is just go into the mask property right here and hit the build button. And what this will do is this gives us a bunch of predefined formats. And what this has is, it, is it, there's a little a bunch of uh, kind of code, character codes that, that determine the type of text that goes in here. For instance, zero means that it's a required number in this case, right? So in this case, we need five required numbers, right? And that makes sense uh, for this one here. Uh, phone number looks a little bit different. We have three nines. Nine means optional number. And you can see these here, these are actual literals, meaning they're going to they're gonna go in no matter what, as they are. Right, so we'll have an open bracket, 999, excuse me, open parentheses, 999, close parentheses, space, and then three required numbers, a dash, and four required numbers. Right? And of course, that's your standard United States phone number there. And then you can have a phone number, no area code. You can see as we go down here, um, and you know, even just some of the common ones, these will, these will cover many of the ones that are out there. You can see zip code here is just like that. We have five required, a dash, and four optional. Now we need to create an IP address. So what we're going to do is go down here to custom and we're going to type our own here. And an IP address goes in the format uh, zero optional optional, right? Dot zero optional optional dot zero optional optional dot zero optional optional. Meaning no matter what the lowest number we can have here is zero dot zero dot zero dot zero. And the highest number we can have is is in this case nine 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 dot nine nine dot nine nine dot nine nine. Even though we really could if we wanted to get uh, fancy here, we can do ranges, you can do all that kind of stuff. If we really wanted to take this and make sure that it's the highest IP range possible, again, we could certainly do that. Uh, or, if you didn't want to do that, we could also do that maybe in a validation uh, in code. But for now, we'll keep it simple, and we'll do this as uh, as our standard IP here, and hit OK. And now you can see it's going to use those placeholders too. And you can change that placeholder character, as you can see, it's called the prompt char. And the prompt char is just what character is going to give the user the visual cue that data goes in here. And you can use whatever you want here. Uh, if we put a zero there, you can see it's going to change them to all zeros. Right? And uh, why don't we do that? We'll leave that at zeros for now. And a couple other properties I want to get you familiar with here. Now we have uh, reject input on first failure. This is just kind of a mean one. You wouldn't want to do this to your users. <laughs> this just basically means that you know on the first failure, are you going to reject the input and send them back to the beginning. Probably not a nice thing to do, so we'll leave that one alone. Uh, reset on prompt and reset on space just, just defines what you want to do when the user types in the prompt character or the space bar. Uh, we also have skip literals. This one will actually uh, uh, skip the literals, so it'll kind of, if you type in 192, you know, dot 192, you don't have to hit the dot, it'll just keep on going. So that'll save them time from actually hit the dot, it'll skip right over it, so that's kind of nice there. Uh, so any literals that you put in, then it would just skip right over them. And uh, some other one you have here is uh, the test text mask format determines, you know, when you when you extract the text out of this mask edit box, what do you want to do? Do you want to include the little literals, include the prompt, exclude prompt and literals, or include the prompt and the literals? Uh, obviously, we're probably going to uh, to include um, the literals here because we want the dots to go over, and uh, that's probably about it. So just just the literals and the actual data itself. So we'll get everything. So we'll get the full IP address and uh, and that's it. So so those are some of the uh, you know some of the most common properties when it comes to this. Of course obviously the biggest common one being the mask itself but just a, a great control to help your users and yourself when it comes to 
inputting formatted data into the application. Now one other quick thing I want to mention on the text box here is you can control the character casing. And if you go up here to the character casing property, you can see I turned it to upper. I, by default it's at normal, meaning of course uh, user discrepancy, whatever they type in is what they get. Uh, here we're going to turn this to upper because it's a server name and we want them to be able to, to just, uh, in this case it could be a server name, it's really the user defined name, but these are usually come in uppercase, so we're going to put that in uppercase and, and just for the sake of doing so. So we'll do that, we'll save it, and I just wanted to mention that, I forgot to mention that on the text box there. Now, let's move on to our, uh, what we call numeric up and down controls and domain up and down controls. Now these are actually both numeric up down controls, and it's pretty simple. Uh, these controls handle all the functionality themselves, it just lets the user, you know, get a little Rather than typing, they can just hit the up to to go up one or down to go down one, that sort of thing. And uh, you know, before we we actually get into these, let me show you where you can find all these controls in the toolbox. If you head on over to the toolbox, here you can see here's the mass text box control. And by the way, this used to be called in previous versions, especially in the old days of Visual Studio, the mass edit box. That's why I keep calling it the mass text edit box because it's kind of the best of all worlds, right? But it's physically actually called the mass text box. Uh, also, here you can find the numeric up down control not far underneath it and then we also have the domain up and down control right and the difference between the domain up down control and the numeric up down control is that numeric is purely for obviously uh, numerics the domain up and down control is for anything else so any other kind of values that you want to stuff in there and cycle through uh, you can do that with the domain up and down control now with with the numeric one which is definitely the most popular one here really all you need to worry about is uh, the maximum value and the minimum value now in this case, for minutes, what's, what's the maximum number and the minimum number of minutes that we want to allow uh, our server to be pinged? Well, obviously, for, if we have a lot of people using this that are constantly running you know, pings against our server, we don't want to degrade performance. So we probably want to set the minimum here at uh, you know, maybe five, two to five minutes. But you know, since, since we're just uh, developing an application for ourselves here, we're just going to go ahead and put the minimum at one minute. Right? And how about we put the maximum at, uh, we'll say... 60 minutes, right? We're not going to go above an hour, otherwise we need an hour up and down uh, control as well. So there you go, maximum 60 minutes, minimum 1 minute. And as far as the seconds go, obviously we want the maximum here to be 59. So the maximum they could go here, technically then on the minute side, we probably want this 59 too, right? So, so the most they can go is 59 minutes and uh, 59 seconds. There we go. So that's it. That's really all you need to worry about here. You can also set a default value as I did here. You can see I put 1 in there as the default value. Um, how about we put the default value at, say, five minutes? That looks like a good, a good default value there. Every five minutes, it would ping the server for its status. Now, obviously, if you have a production server that and you, that is critical, and you're using this application as its kind of uh, portal into that, then you may want to put that a little bit lower every couple of minutes because it really wouldn't hurt just to ping the server. Because what we're going to end up doing is running uh, a stored procedure against the server, and that's you know very minimal as far as performance is concerned. Running a stored, uh, a system stored procedure against the server. Now one other thing I want to mention here with our numeric up and down controls is that uh, the increment. The increment is also an important one because this is, uh, you know, obviously how many are we going to go up or how many are we going to go down when the user clicks on the up or down air arrow. And uh, so that's important. The, the only other real important one, uh, another one that you'll see in here is the thousand separator. If you're dealing with large numbers, you can choose to show the thousand separator within there. Now the last set of controls we're going to look at here are list controls. And uh, really we're going to look at the list box itself, but really the list box, the checked list box, and the combo box all work the same way as far as putting data into them, taking data out of them, and generally working with them. They all work pretty much the same programmatically, the same properties, the same ways of doing things. Uh, really it's, it's the way that, that they're accessed by the user is what makes them different. For instance, the list box is going to display a list of, of contents, right? We're going to fill this up with a bunch of choices. And the user can either work with one choice at a time if we allow them to, right? Or uh, we can set this to a to kind of a, a single select list box, meaning they can only choose one item at a time. Or we can set it to a multi-select list box where they can hold their control key down or their shift key down and select multiple items, right? A checked list box is the exact same thing. Instead of selecting, though, they're going to put checks next to them, right? And so the only difference then is when we're looping through the items, we'll check we'll check the checked property, <laughs> check the checked property there to make sure that the item was actually chosen or not. And the combo box is, again, it's still a list. We're still filling up with a list of items. The difference, though, is that they're only going to be able to work with one at a time, and it's kind of a text box at the same time because they can type in, uh, type items into the actual combo box itself. 
So we're going to work with the list box here, and of course we will work with combo boxes down the road uh, throughout the video because they are a very common control. Uh, but just know we're going to work with the list box here specifically because uh, they all pretty much do the same thing. At least programmatically anyway. And that's how we're going to work with it here is programmatically. Just to show you here, uh, again, most of the properties are the same as, as your standard properties for your other controls. The difference here is you have a data source. We can dynamically fill up list boxes, and we'll do that when we get into data. We'll, we'll do lots of things of that nature. Um, other than that, they're pretty common properties here as far as what most uh, controls have. Uh, of course, if you want to work with this statically, meaning you don't want to programmatically work with it, then you can hit the items property here, and you can just start putting items in here. So item 1, item 2, item 3, so on and so forth. So we hit enter, and look at that. They go in there, right? Pretty easy. Now, we're going to actually do this dynamically. I'm going to show you how to work with this in code, uh, because that's really where the use comes in. So let's go ahead and, uh, and go into the code window here. I'm just going to go ahead and click on our code button up here in Solution Explorer to take us into it. And you can see I wrote a bunch of code already here for it. And basically what I did here is I made a subroutine. And this subroutine is called fill user database list. And what we're going to do here is the first thing we need to do is because this is going to be based on our server list view, meaning they have to have selected an item in the list view in order for us to go to the server and retrieve the users in the databases. So we're kind of simulating that here. Um, and the first thing we do, and what we're doing to, to, to do that little check there is we're saying if me, meaning of course the form here, dot, and that'll give us a list of objects or controls, list LV servers, that's the name of our list view up here, right? LV servers. Selected items, meaning, of course, the items that they currently have selected, right? And of course, we're going to make this, when we get there, this list views, they're only going to be able to select one item at a time, right? We can't have them select multiple items, which one will we choose to fill the data in down here for them to work with? So they only will be able to select one item. So that's what we're just doing is selected items that count greater than zero. Uh, if it's greater than zero, then we're going to clear out anything that was previously inside of our list box here. So if there are any previous selections from a previous uh, previous uh, server selection here, we're going to clear all those out, and then we're going to fill it up. And what we're going to do here is first it's just going to be static. So we're just going to create a loop here that's going to loop through this block of code ten times. And what we're going to do here is call the uh, the add method on the items collection on our list box. So this is it, just just like we were just doing over here. Here's the items collection in the property window. We're just accessing it in code this time. We're saying give us the items collection, and we're going to call the add method on it so we can add something to it. And what we're going to do is we're going to actually add a string to it. We're going to say uh, the word server space, and then we're going to add to it the actual uh, index of the item that was selected in the list, right? So in this case, it'll be server 1, server 2, server 3, server 4. So we're kind of doing this all statically now. This will make a lot more sense when we get in and actually pull information from the database. But for now, uh, again, we're just going to grab the index of the item that was selected and add 1 to it, because indexes are 0 based. So really here, item 1 is item 0, item 2 is 1, item 3 is 2, item 4 is 3, so on and so forth. So that's, that's what they mean by 0 based indexes as we start at uh, the number 0. So that's why we're adding 1 to it. So 0 will actually be 1, 1 will actually be 2, so on and so forth, and so it'll match the text data within our actual list view over here on our main form, right? And then what we're doing is we're adding to this concatenating more text to it, and we're throwing in an inter intermediate if statement, they call this. And basically what we're doing here is we're saying, if the user's radio button is checked, then put the word user in it. Otherwise, put the word database in it, right? And that's it. And then, uh, and then of course, we're going to add the actual uh, item number as well in there. So let me show you how this works here. If we... Uh, we, d we added that code. Let's go ahead and hit the run button. All right, and I'll click on this item, and there we go. So server1, user1. Okay, if we click on databases, it's going to say server1, database1. Right, so all the way down. It's so up to ten times. And just to go over that one more time here, just to unconfuse you, if you are confused, here's our int item is our number. Right, so we're appending the number uh, to it. So this will be database one, the first loop, database two, database three, all the way up to database ten, or user, whichever the radio button is selected. The rest is just, you know, the, the server. So this will always say server one or server two, all the way down for every ten items. This is what's adding the number into it, is the user database, and then the int item, because that will be the number on the counter here, through the loop. So that's how that works. So the whole point of that, of course, is just adding items to the list box here, um, and we do that, do that using the add method. You can see, and there we go. So users, databases, users, databases, and it's just refilling it up. We'll close out of that, 
and uh, and of course go back into our code window here. And by the way, this is what clears out. So we clear it out every time before we go through that loop. That's why it, it's not.